and welcome to the, the October GoGN webinar, our first post Bayer <laughs> webinar. So, um, unfortunately, Bayer could join. She wanted to come in tonight, but she's uh, she's out gallivanting around Delft somewhere, I think. Um, so tonight, we're really pleased to have uh, Chrissy Narance join us. Um, I think most of you in the chat room do know Chrissy, but if you don't, uh, she's a, a GoGN alumni. Was it about a year ago you finished your PhD, Chrissy? 20, yes, 2017. Yeah, yeah. Oct um, October. Yeah. So, yes, October, uh, exactly one year yes, ago. That's right, yeah. <laughs> um, so, and she's been a really enthusiastic and, and a vital member of, of the community. Um, I won't say much about her because I think she wants to sort of take you through some of the things she does in her presentation. I don't sort of want to steal her thunder. But I want to say, look, as much as I like webinars and we can bring people in, in Chris's case, there is a slight disadvantage because usually when she does, workshops she usually brings along toys and sweets and cake and those kind of things so you're just gonna have to supply those things for yourself i'm afraid and uh, <laughs> and, and imagine them but uh, i'll hand it over to you now chrissy so thanks very much okay thank you very much uh, martin for the introduction and thank you very much for inviting me and Bea, who is not uh, here today because i started talking about this webinar um with Bea. i am going to switch off the camera for now i think so I can uh, focus a bit better. <laughs> and um, what I would like to, um, to share with you today is bits from my journey as a PhD student, what I discovered and um, what I'm doing now. Um, on the screen, I'm just trying to move that little window here because it's in the middle of the slide still. I, okay, here we go. Okay, you see PhD bottles and um, these are bottles that really exist. <laughs> I saw them walking around um, at, at another town. I went with my family uh, at the weekend when I was a PhD student and it was very tempting to just get one. But obviously it's not the same. We know that we all go through a lot of pain uh, in that P uh, on that PhD journey, uh, but we also learn a lot. So just taking it from the shelf would be the same. I hope you agree with that. Um, so, like I said, uh, we will. Um, I will try and introduce you some bits that I did during my uh, doctoral journey. Share some of the key findings. Uh, explore what followed, uh, and uh, see what what are the potential implications for academic development. What I haven't said yet is that I'm an academic developer in the Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching at Manchester Metropolitan University, and I've been doing that since 2008. Um, Manchester Met is my third higher education institution in the UK. Uh, Jennifer, who I think is with us, will uh, recognize a tweet here. <laughs> yes, I think she did. And um, yes, my study was actually phenomenography and not phenomenology. I, I'm not correcting. Um, you could say that phenomenography uh, is sort of part of um, the theoretical perspective in Crotty's sort of um, uh, world under phenomenology. But the key difference as a methodology, I don't know if anybody knows and wants to contribute, you're very welcome to share here. Uh, and we have Penny with us, who is also doing a phenomenographic study, is that in phenomenography we actually study the lived experience of a phenomenon as it is described collectively by individuals while in phenomenology i hope i'm not losing you yet we study the phenomenon so that is the key difference uh, another thing is uh, my study was uh, i was looking into collaborative learning and again this is a term that um, if you read um, my thesis in the in the literature review you, you will see that there is some um, sort of um, not clear distinction often between uh, theorists and practitioners what the difference is between um, collaborative learning and cooperative learning. Uh, and I did the workshop on Monday and I tried to explain it using uh, pieces of wool, which you have here in front of you. I'm just going to ask you, which one do you think is or represents, visualizes collaborative learning and which one is? No, let's just say which one is collaborative learning on the left or on the right? If you just go into the chat and say either R or L. So I'm just asking about collaborative learning. Okay, so the majority of you um, say that it is left. And Irvin, I'm sorry to say 
the people who said left are actually right, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so in collaborative learning, basically what we have is we have individuals working together on producing either product or uh, sharing that process collaboratively and the individual contribution becomes um, sort of intertwined with everybody else's that we can't actually separate it out while in cooperative learning everybody contributes a little bit uh, to the whole and when i explained that actually a colleague was saying ah that's that's like writing uh, an edited book. So cooperative learning, we could say, um, resembles writing uh, or editing um, a book that has edited chapters, basically with different contributions, while co-authoring could be um, sort of the way at looking at collaborative learning. I hope that makes sense. So, when you see pages like this, sort of bright and yellow with black text, um, there will be questions or I would like to um, further engage you uh, in, in the discussion and get uh, your thoughts and I hope that will be okay. If you want to take the microphone also, like uh, Martin said uh, earlier, please uh, activate the, the question button that you see. I can't actually see that button. So let's look at this uh, PhD then. Um, my supervisory team uh, were Dr. Sandra Cairncross from Edinburgh Napier University and Professor Keith Smythe from the University of the Highlands uh, and the Islands. But we do know and um, a colleague here from Australia, actually, Lilia uh, Mantai, uh, has done her PhD on how uh, and what support PhD students uh, need. And what she wrote is that it takes actually a whole village. So the supervisory team will never ever be enough. So let's have a look at my uh, little village here. So these are just some of the people from my global uh, village and I was very fortunate in 2015 to join uh, the OGN uh, family and here you will see some of the pictures uh, we took on our adventures in three different cr countries in Krakow, uh, then in South Africa and um, very recently in, um, in Delft and some of you might be on these pictures even. <laughs> uh, there are further colleagues here on the on the right uh, from my own institution but also further afield uh, i'll just uh, name um, peter stephen charles and margie but there are many many more that i all name uh, in my uh, in my thesis so my question over to you now is who lives in your village and if you would like to respond uh, in the chat that would be wonderful. The GoGN uniform, yes. <laughs> so who is in your village? Colleagues who listen, says Chris. Here we are again. <laughs> Faculty, students, colleagues, okay. Many on Twitter. So we all agree that um, there is a, usually a village that includes family, friends, colleagues from nearby, but also from further afield. And I think we are very fortunate that uh, we have uh, our GoGN family as well, which helps us through and connect um, with colleagues more globally. Old as well. That is great. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so when I started my PhD journey, when we start our PhD journey, we are usually very excited, isn't it? And it is like um, growing up again, I think. That's how it felt for me. So in year one, and I did mine um, as a part-time, I was a part-time student, um, I did my first baby steps. And I, while I was excited because I finally uh, learned to walk, uh, I then became a toddler uh, in year two. And that really, really happened. Um, in year three, I matured a bit emotionally. And that was actually the year when um, GoGN came into my life. I then, because I built my network and I felt that I have um, wider support, uh, I felt that I'm actually 
going somewhere and uh, I'm, I was getting going towards more independent. Uh, in year four, like I said, um, I did mine part time. Um, I wanted to finish. I from four, I moved to uh, becoming a 14, a teenager who was becoming impatient and just wanted to finish. So I actually finished in four point five uh, years instead of um, five. That was the earliest I could finish as a PhD student. Um, I don't know where you are on your journey. It might be nice to to share that with us here as well and how you feel. Please use the chat um, to do that. But I did finish, like Martin said earlier, in 2017 and seeing the, the final piece of work um, is is satisfying. I have to say, um, before the Viva, one is quite scared. I was scared to open it to see any 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 potential errors, but I have to say I I use it now. Uh, I have overcome that fear and I did overcome that fear in the Viva as well. And uh, I am using it and I can see how it still um, is useful in my everyday practice, but also in the research that I am doing. I had two external examiners, which I did uh, one external examiner and one internal. I didn't know um, the ladies, but um, they both recognized the strengths of um, of the work that I have done. And that boosted my my confidence and, and self-belief, I think. Um, they say here that um, it was radical. Um, and I don't know, some of you do know me. So um, I think it does represent a little bit of uh, who I am and what I do. Um, the work though, of the PhD um, is based on practice that I started in 2010 and uh, some of that work uh, has been captured in a related publication. I have that here. I will share the presentation. You can have a look if anybody is interested in that. You will see that some of that stuff, I started uh, my PhD in 2013. Some of that was um, much earlier, um, but I also kept publishing during my studies. Um, the research question that I had um, were around collaborative learning and uh, I had three. I wanted to explore the experience of collaborative learning in uh, open course institutional courses in the area of uh, academic development or optional learning. I'm not sure we have colleagues here from different parts of the world so the terminology uh, might be different. and. Um, in these courses, I looked at the characteristic that really made a difference to collaborative learning and I synthesized in the research question three, the um, one and two, where I was um, planning to design a, a framework that was bringing together because phenomenography, and I'm going to speak about phenomenography uh, in a tiny bit, um, is about making change to practice. So the contribution to knowledge is linked um, to my research question. You can see that if you are still a student, I think it's quite useful to do that because that will help you then articulate that specifically uh, in your VIVA as well. I know in some um, countries you don't have uh, VIVA or uh, oral defense, how it's called. But um, I think if you even write about it, I see some um, pencils moving around the screen. <laughs> I'm not sure, might be Martin. Um, but uh, it is uh, useful to um, to see if you are actually on track because the research we are doing is linked to our uh, research question, which do change often uh, during the process, but the final um, product, the final outputs are linked. So mine, I have gained further insights into collaborative learning. And uh, specifically, I have identified that there are two specific forms, immersive uh, or patterns, immersive and selective collaboration, and that uh, staff, students, the public, and the online and offline uh, element in open uh, learning in these settings was um, played a significant role in that uh, experience. Um, from a course perspective, the features that um, influenced and shaped that experience were the facilitation, the elasticity of the design and the community. Um, and what was then quite easy to prove that I have a contribution to practice was the collaborative uh, open uh, learning framework that I developed because that actually didn't exist um, at all um, before my study. So 
Yes, I used phenomenography. Um, Penny had um, given a wonderful webinar a few months ago. I can't remember exactly when the recording is online, where she explained in detail what phenomenography uh, is. Ferenc Martin came up with this idea and other colleagues um, in Sweden. And it is about um, exploring the conceptions of the lived experiences, but as uh, a collective. And for me, that was quite interesting. I'd used it before. Um, in, in a smaller scale study, um, but um, now I was here doing a whole PhD uh, using phenomenography and it wasn't an easy task because I ended up with over 100,000 um, words um, as my total tran transcript, which I had to, to use and, uh, and code. So I use phenomenography. I don't know what you are using. And I was actually thinking when I was putting that together, if it would be useful on the GoGN website, maybe. Uh, could we have um, a page, a section somewhere, uh, Martin, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how everybody else feels, where we actually say what methodologies um, people are using. Because if we need help and support, I think that might be quite useful as well. So. What methodology would be helpful? OK, great. Um, well, we'll leave it to the boss. Martin can decide. <laughs> so what are you using? Grounded theory, Helen. OK. Loads of challenges. If you want to add some of the challenges, just very quickly. Let's get on with it. OK. <laughs> I like that decision making. Rapid decision making. That's great. So, a colleague seemed to um, agree that it might be a useful um, sort of section on the website. Also, perhaps, yeah, for external examining in the future. Free paper dissertation. Too elastic. So Helen says the methodology is too elastic. Yes, and I think that's a common characteristic also with phenomenography. And there are similarities between a grounded theory and uh, phenomenology and uh, phenomenography. And I think one thing is if we feel less confident, uh, the increased freedom might actually not be very helpful. Um, but I think, Helen, the more you progress, and I know that you have progressed quite a lot, the more confident you become, the more you feel actually that this freedom is liberating and you can make it your own. Uh, I hope you feel that way now that you have done the analysis. Totally agree. OK, great. I use constructive, constructivist grounded theory, says Catherine. That's good. Um, I don't know a lot about that and how that differs from uh, grounded theory, but that might be nice to discuss maybe with uh, with Helen also. <laughs> Great. OK, thank you very much, everybody. Um, what I did is, and um, some of these slides that follow, I did use them in the Viva. So if you have an oral defense um, ahead of you or a Viva, whatever you call it, or do a presentation on on where you are at the moment, I have found a visualization of the whole study, uh, a map, um, was really, really useful. Actually, during the Viva, I didn't open uh, the thesis once. I had three bits of paper, and that was one of them, uh, printed out, stating on which page that was, uh, and I worked uh, my responses uh, through that. This here shows that I used two cases, and I'm not going to go into detail uh, into this. I used two cases, and uh, through these, I did uh, 22 uh, individual phenomenographic uh, interviews that led to the categories of descriptions and an outcome space, which is the visualization and the final output of the um, phenomenographic analysis. And through that, I developed then the framework also through looking critically uh, and discussing the, the literature. But in phenomenography, and that's quite um, uncommon, I would say, uh, I think in grounded theory it is similar. Uh, the analysis happens first and the review of the literature happens then as a response to the analysis. Uh, and that is one part of um, uh, bracketing approach because the phenomenographer, as you can see, sits outside of the research study. I was not part of the, um, the research. 
well, I was part of the research, but not part of the study. And um, there is um, some theories say there's a danger that uh, data becomes contaminated. So we need to take certain um, approaches to bracket and suspend uh, our judgment. And one of them um, was that other ones was that I kept a very uh, analytical diary during the, um, the analysis stage, um, but I also shared the, um, the categories of description that I did, the, the transcripts also, but also the findings uh, when I then articulated it in the thesis with my uh, research participants. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, Penny says uh, phenomenography is similar. Yes, um, we said earlier, I don't know, Helen, if you were here, that phenomenology looks at the phenomenon, while phenomenography is how the phenomenon is experienced um, by a series of individuals, but collectively, and their conceptions of that experience. Um, now, I know you're talking about grounded series, so I'll let you have that chat with, um, with Penny. Okay, so the categories of description that I found were in these three pools here. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into these here, but it's just to show the, the range of um, uh, categories of description and their variations uh, that I had. We'll just briefly look at the one in the middle, the yellow one, boundary crossing, uh, and uh, I'll come back to that on the next slide i think no um they're actually here and i'm going to go back so boundary crossing was um like uh, in any research i guess a big surprise but here what is um i think uh, Im important to note is that academic development first of all usually happens in institutions and it's very much uh, focused on that institution um, we reached out um, the courses were cross-institutional but also cross uh, sector. So um, there were participants, study participants who were not from higher education. And um, what we can see here is from the analysis that this boundary crossing across professional context uh, in particular came also out as one of the, the categories, but also through time and place. And that was the online and the offline dimension and the mobile um, dimension as well. Um, one other thing is that, uh, yeah, in, again, in academic development, usually we have uh, colleagues working towards a qualification or doing informal um, workshops or, or courses. Here, they were brought together and there were colleagues working um, for qualifications, uh, recognitions either within the institution or for professional bodies. So there were opportunities and I think they, well, the evidence shows that they did find that um, really valuable, that they could work towards something else. So it wasn't just an open course they participated. And I'm very briefly going to go back because that is the outcome space. That is uh, a different picture to this. Basically, these are the categories of description uh, and their logical relationships have been um, shown here on this uh, outcome space. That's what um, phenomenography looks like, basically, the, the, the last product of, um, of the analysis. And again, these are um, bits of paper in uh, printed out I took into my... <laughs> okay, so... I have already mentioned that uh, the area I have been looking at is academic development. Um, there are other scholars, and you will know some of these names here, who have looked at um, especially boundary crossing and the, the open educational practices from different perspectives. I've highlighted the first and the last one, a public facing scholar uh, without Tony here. <laughs> I don't know if he's here, no. Uh, and Peter Schuke, the community-based, because these two uh, look at it from an angle of the practitioner, um, while the the leaky institution and bounded curricula and the porous university look at it from an institutional perspective. Uh, my work, the angle that I looked at, uh, was in academic development from a practitioner perspective. So there were not formal courses that uh, colleagues joined. There were informal 
across institutional collaborations among institutions and practitioners. And what I have here is, I'll just give you a minute or two to read, is um, one, one of the quotes that I got about boundary crossing that I mentioned a bit earlier about the professional context. I'll just give you a minute or two to read. Okay, I think you had uh, the time at least to read the, the bits blue. And what you can see here is uh, an academic, a study participant, talking about if we were all from academia, yeah, we would all either agree or disagree or say, oh, that doesn't work. <laughs> um, so they found it especially refreshing, not just that they're working with colleagues from other institutions, from other cultures, from other disciplines, but also that they were working with the wider public and that the ideas the, the new ideas uh, opened their minds to new possibilities within their practice. And that's not something that uh, happens very often. So I just wanted to, to make a note of that. There's a problem with the sound. Can you, I don't know if you can hear me. It's okay here. I don't know, Martin. It's fine for us. Okay, um, I can't remember now who had the problem. Fine for me. Okay, um, now as part of the, the study, and I did develop a, a framework, I reviewed also existing framework, and that's just a list. It's tiny here. You will probably not even see what's on that slide unless you're on a big, big screen. Um, but uh, I did review a number of, uh, of frameworks that um, are supported by uh, technology and uh, were conceptual and some of them were em empirical as well. So through that review, I identified four common characteristics and these were the facilitator support, activities, community and choice. These four factors played um, an important part of these frameworks to enable uh, collaborative learning. Now, this is a framework that um, came out near my submission. And, you know, when things like that appear near your submission and you think, oh my God, somebody else has done the work that <laughs> <laughs> that I have been doing. I'm sure we all had that fear. I had it. Um, I didn't want to read it, but then I started reading it and I thought, oh, that's really interesting. It's not what I have done. And I think we need to remember that we're all doing a study um, that will be unique because the data that we have, nobody else will have the same data. <laughs> yes, uh, Martin just said it's a common PhD anxiety. Yes, I felt it. So I had my moment. And um, th when I over when I did overcome that fear, I thought that's really interesting because that uh, framework here, open education framework done by colleagues, uh, Andrea Inamorata Dos Santos and colleagues in the European Commission is a very big and wide project that looks at institutional collaborations and the uh, opportunities open education presents for institutions to col collaborate more widely. So. The angle that I had uh, have looked at, I just looked at uh, collaborative open learning, which is part of the pedagogical approach, uh, you could say. So when I started reading about um, what was um, in that publication about pedagogy, it wasn't uh, articulated in detail. So I was OK. <laughs> Uh, and it, I did integrate it, obviously, in the in the literature view because there's a danger there. Um, thinking, oh, I'm near to submit now. I don't need to include anything else. No, we do need to to look at what's relevant, and I think um, make the time and effort to to link it to our work. But what did come out is. Um, that was after submission and Dili Fang uh, in 2017 um, brought out her book, The Connected Curriculum. And I had already submitted and I couldn't uh, in include that and I didn't uh, include that. But I recently looked at it again and um, 
I found that she mentioned open 61 times, I think uh, two or three times uh, open education resources. She talks about the curriculum, um, an inquiry-based curriculum, how we can link to, to industry without explicitly making um, reference to open education. So in my Viva, I think I did mention that framework because um, often we are asked so what what new thing came out <laughs> um, but one thing she did does mention is that the framework is designed to open up ideas and practices so the the spirit of open is there um, uh, it's focused on openness linking to industry and the use of open education resources which i think is mentioned twice but she also makes reference brief reference to um, collaborative learning and uh, um, what she mentions is that there are often difficulties in, uh, in, in collaborative learning and how to overcome these would be through uh, inquiry-based learning. The framework that I developed based on, uh, on my study is this one here and this is not the form that uh, I have it in the, um, in the actual thesis, that's something I made uh, later and uh, it has three sections it talks about the learning engagement patterns these are the patterns that um, um, study participants sort of uh, experienced the learning needs these um, these patterns sort of align with and the design characteristics which are uh, around and there are 10 of them uh, in total that the the specific uh, courses in cross-institutional collaboration had now one thing that i want to clarify that these patterns are not directly linked to individuals because they are dynamic it's almost like a continuum today i might uh, work in uh, in a selective collaboration mode but my situation might change tomorrow or the week after so I um, I become an uh, I participate as an immersive collaborator um, what we need to be careful here is not to pe put people uh, into boxes but the learning needs uh, that are linked to these learning patterns uh, provide um, useful I think uh, useful information to course designers uh, facilitators but also uh, academic developers, learning technologists, whoever uh, is involved in uh, in creating uh, learning opportunities, to uh, to design um, interventions that would help uh, individuals to to learn when they um, uh, when they adapt these uh, different patterns. Are there any questions so far? Are we okay to move on? I'm back in. Okay. So the after obviously putting everything together, I had the Viva in the UK. We have um, this oral defense. I think uh, Viv calls it oral defense. <laughs> and um, people are not very familiar with phenomenography, Penny, uh, in the UK, despite the fact, you know, that it's, um, I think, quite uh, well known uh, in uh, Scandinavian countries, in uh, Australia, in the UK as well. But um, there were still some challenges. So I used Lego. I used a bag of Lego to explain uh, my um, the methodology that I used, uh, and it seemed to work. If anybody wants any help um, with uh, preparing for the Viva, have a look on my uh, blog. You might find something that uh, will help you. Have all the questions uh, that I was asked, but also the ones that I, I wasn't asked, and how I prepared. It's uh, it's all online. <laughs> <clears throat> So how will you, I think some of you have uh, finished, um, others are in the middle or near to, um, to submit your um, thesis. So how do you plan to, um, to prepare? Or how did you um, prepare? For example, Viv and Catherine, uh, as far as I know, have finished. Other people might as well, but I might not know everybody. No viable for us in Australia. Yes. <laughs> no all defense. 
a lot of rehearsing. So how did you do that, Viv? Just give us a, a bit more information. <clears throat> Mock vivas, yes, I did loads of them. Uh, some of them with my husband as well. <laughs> Used graphics on screen, excellent. Did you use those then in the uh, in the viva as well? Yes, uh, we, we seem to have uh, all of us uh, used visual aids, isn't it, to to get ready. Immerse myself in many, many questions. Great. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Go back to the thesis and highlight important aspects. Wonderful. And you might want to put sticky notes as well at the end. I didn't use them. I have loads of sticky notes on, on the uh, thesis that I submitted for the Viva. Twitter hashtag. Mm -hmm. Very good. So a range of um, of things. Um, some of these activities we do on our own, and other ones we uh, involve others. Uh, my suggestion would be to to involve others as well, because it's it's good to get that um, to get questions perhaps that we wouldn't expect. <laughs> okay, so what followed? So I have finished, and um, I am keen to get a PhD student. So what I did is I completed a, a research degree a supervision module that um, I could do at, in my institution. I have finished a master's in coaching and mentoring. And some people might say, you just finished a PhD. Why on earth did you do another master's? I, sh I, uh, <laughs> I joined, joined with advanced standing, so I only had to do the dissertation. But I did the dissertation on doctoral researchers' development. So I was quite strategic, I think, because that's an area I wanted to develop and uh, get better at. Um, I have um, started writing. Um, about my uh, my work and that was quite hard because when you think that something is finished then to get back into it but um, I need to do it I know that I need to do it and I have started doing it as you can see here but I've also have the opportunity and I don't know if um, one of our colleagues has joined us here, but she will see what's coming. Um, I've started using the framework because the framework has been developed to be used. It's uh, available under Creative Commons license and anybody can use it and adapt it. But I also wanted to see if uh, it could be used in any of the activities that I am involved. So, I at the beginning of this year, I had the opportunity to work with Naomi and Naomi is also a GoGN member. She said she would join a bit later. I'm not sure if she's here. I haven't seen her yet. Uh, and um, Alisha Abdidyanov from um, Uzbekistan on an UNESCO supported project. And um, we have suggested the framework. Uh, you can see it uh, one of the circles here as one of the interventions we have put to put together a mentoring proposal. Uh, Naomi was a lead mentor and I the co-mentor for uh, the professional development of uh, foreign language uh, uh, teachers uh, in Uzbekistan who undergo uh, re-accreditation every three years. And uh, they have identified A, that the pass rate is quite low. Uh, and B, that uh, the language skills, and particularly we looked at English, um, are, could also be improved. So we put a proposal together that had three sections, uh, pedagogy, the curriculum and technology. And within the pedagogy, we um, proposed the, um, the collaborative open and learning framework. Uh, it was well received, but now it's uh, up to the university uh, in Uzbekistan to um, to make uh, some decisions there locally and see how they can adapt and uh, what can actually be implemented in short term, mid term uh, and long term. And uh, my idea is from that uh, framework in collaborative for open learning that is has a focus on engagement to uh, develop now an uh, open framework, uh, open learning framework uh, more generally that has also the autonomous learning um, within it. So we are near the end and um, 
I just want to, um, I don't know how familiar you are with academic development. I think many of you are very familiar with it, but uh, we all know that um, our role um, works better our work is better uh, also received and we can achieve more when we work with people, with other academics in uh, networks uh, in commun and communities. Um, my, my colleague, and he's retiring at the end of the year, <laughs> Charles actually, who, who did some uh, research in that area, um, has found that as well, that these democratic strategies where they are not top down um, and we are not seen as a soft arm of, of management, like others um, say, uh, work much, much better. Also, uh, academics often reach out to external networks uh, and communities after they do what they have to do for the institution, sometimes uh, a teaching qualification or professional recognition. And that's where they feel they belong. What my work adds is that um, academics actually um, want to harness um, open educational practices in cross-institutional settings where they can also interact and open education, we all know that, open practices give you that opportunity to work and learn with not just academics, not just with students, but also with the wider public. And that seems to be a, a really a valuable uh, opportunity um, that has been, that has come out um, from uh, my study. Um, and if you just read the bits uh, in blue, I think I'll just give you one minute that confirms how academic development could actually, uh, that's again from one of uh, the study participants, how academic development could actually change as a result of this. I'll give you one minute. So here you see that um, this participant is suggesting that academic developers work with colleagues in other institutions. And I think the, it, it does make um, the, the whole approach of, of professional development more uh, democratic and distributed. And uh, I think that that was a, was a nice thing, you know, a nice um, and useful, I think, discovery because often academic development is inwards facing. Here it's highlighted the opportunities that openness brings to look outwards, connect and, and learn and develop um, with others. Um, and that was it. I mean, I think Radox has cracked uh, what academia is <laughs> and um, what, um, what PhD students need. So, Feel positive, feel energized, feel free, and if there is a stress relief there, and as you can see, that bottle is quite empty. <laughs> so I'm not promoting uh, Radox, but it was really interesting to discover that I had all these things here uh, at home uh, and use them. <laughs> so. I think I stopped, yes, it's 10, 10 to, so we still have a little bit of time, um, but I would say is thank you very much, uh, go then. thank you very much all my colleagues who are here, many of whom I've met in person and we have uh, also talked uh, online. Um, we do need each other and we do need to stick uh, to each other and support each other because together we can achieve so much more. This is a little sticker um, we created thanks to Judith who is not uh, with us today Day. and I'm grateful for uh, everything that GoGN has done, but also all of you. Over to you. Thank you very much, Chrissy. Excellent stuff. Um, so I don't think we haven't got a little applause thing, so you have to just write it <laughs> clapping. Or applause. <laughs> Thank, thanks very much. I think that I think it's almost like we had two presentations in one. Then, or there were two. So I think there's the kind of some people really want to know more about your methodology and your on your research but what i think also was really interesting just the kind of the practical advice you gave on like how to get through a, a phd so um i'll open questions up on on either those mm -hmm. or anything else that anyone's got i think you know so so even if you're not using a similar approach to you i think just sort of some of the those practical tips i think particularly around your use of 
graphics and how to approach survival mm -hmm. is very very mm -hmm. useful thank you Christy. so okay uh, if anyone wants to ask a question just uh, press the ask a question button or you can ask it in the chat and uh, and i'll uh, mm -hmm. respond there. so thank, thank you. you thank you martin i've been uh, the last bottle says stress relief and uh, i'm sure we all need it i as you can see i have emptied the bottle <laughs> <laughs> So Erwin says, any thoughts on organizational structures for cross-institutional collaborations? Yes, I mean, the ones that the, the, um, the courses that I looked at were informal collaborations. And uh, what I've seen is these informal collaborations make um, the whole process more flexible. Decisions are made quickly and uh, assessment, if that's done locally within the institutional level, works much, much easier. So you can have cross institution, informal cross-institutional collaboration in academic development where you have two institutions or, or more working together. And that was the case in both of the courses I looked at. And the first one, um, which was FDOL, Flexible Distance uh, Online Learning, which has now two parent courses. One of them is still running, the Open Networked Learning uh, in Sweden. That was a collaboration between Salford, when I was at Salford in Sweden, Karolin, the Karolinska Institute. What we had is we had assessment attached locally uh, at institutional level um, and that kept it uh, very nice and smooth because um, groups of learners could come together to collaborate um, but the assessment was done um, within the institution so there were no no issues there or, or nothing sort of formal to um, to organize arrange or sign any agreements etc does this answer your question Arvin. And what, what also I think what I need to say uh, to add to that is that uh, because the nature of these collaborations uh, is informal, it empowers individual to actually act. <laughs> and that's quite um, significant, I think, because we often get things from the top uh, and things that we have to do, but here practitioners feel empowered. Uh, to actually do something that's um, and innovate. Thanks, Chrissy. So, uh, Deb asks, how long did it take to find your research questions? Um, I think it, it, was, it was interesting when you shared your research questions. Should we go back to them? Yeah, I think actually, I mean, Deb's probably indicating something there that I think a lot of researchers find it difficult to formulate good research questions. So, um, it made me think that actually a, a useful thing to do for GoGen would be just to kind of extract everyone's research questions, have those in one place, just sort of knowing how to frame them. But it'd be interesting to hear kind of how many iterations you went around, I think, for those. Mm -hmm. I kept my research question, and I, Debbie, I'm very happy to share that. I have a spreadsheet where I have um, the research questions and how they evolved over time. So I have all the versions. I think there were three or four, but if I look back at the original one, which I can't remember now, they were quite similar. Uh, I think there were only small tweaks uh, to get the language uh, right, but I'm very happy to share that. I don't know if Catherine wants to come in, maybe use the microphone and say what her process was. Link to the research question, Catherine. You should have voice now, Catherine, so there should be a little audio button. Is my audio on? Yes. Yeah, cool. <laughs> okay, great. Um, yeah, I can only reinforce just what you said, Chrissy, there about the versioning. I mean, the mine were largely the same, but um, they were refined continually all the way mm -hmm. all the way right up until near the end. I did refine my scope in probably about a year before I finished and so one of my questions changed considerably because I was going to have more of a student voice um, but that was really beyond the scope of finishing in four and a half years like you did so um, so I, I kind of shaved shaved that off but by by and large they were the same as they were in the beginning but just refined continually. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing, Catherine. Um, 
I think the research questions are important, but they are difficult to articulate. That's where you need support from your supervisors, I think, also at the beginning and sound advice, because the research question will then define what methodology you are using. So these things need to be aligned. <laughs> um, and because I wanted to explore, in my case here, um, collaborative learning um, um, and the experience itself, how that is experienced, um, I felt that phenomenography would give me that uh, opportunity. So it's knowing, first of all, what, what you want to explore, I think. Martin, if you want to come in and then no, no, seeing no, no. how that links to the methodology. So I was going to say, I've given Deb the mic as well. So you should okay. have the audio button. So I think Deb wants to ask a question. Thanks. Can you speak, Deb? Oh, hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I feel like a medium. Can you speak, Deb? I can hear a voice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Is there anybody there? Someone, someone called Deb who wants to speak to us. Like, on you go. <laughs> oh, hi, everybody. Thanks, Chrissy. That was so good. That's really, really helpful. Yeah, the, the reason I asked that question is um, my, as you know, Chrissy, my, my PhD is a modular program. Um, we've had something like five, um, five chances to have a go at um sort of mini research um, in the module programs and I'm coming up to the end of that bit now and that's something I've struggled with every single time is is nailing nailing the research questions and I was really interested to to hear about your um, your excel spreadsheet that you've got so I just wanted to say thanks ever so much for that because that's kind of um kind of helped me a bit I think and um to hear it from other people as well would be really really useful Martin so that's all I wanted to say thank you <laughs> That's okay. Yes, don't panic, I would say, with the research question. You know, if you feel they need to change and be adapted, go ahead. Just keep a, keep all the versions, the previous ones, until you finish, until you submit so you have that. Because you might actually end up going back to a previous version. That might also happen. <laughs> you know, sometimes we refine, refine, and then we over-engineer something, but actually say, right, well, I had it right earlier. <laughs> so that's also... Uh, a possibility. Uh, I think there was a question from Penny about trustworthiness of him, how I argued my findings. Well, I think for in phenomenography, it's about being uh, transparent, transparent with the process. And I, I did that through, uh, like I said earlier, through sharing my, my um, well, A, through keeping a reflective diary, which was part of the thesis. And I submitted that uh, to um, the examiners. That was part of the thesis I submitted. They then asked me to take it out in the final because it was necessary, but for the Viva, um, they felt that was useful to have. So it's being transparent um, um, with yourself, but also with your uh, study participants and aware of where where are, where are you positioned? Where, where do you position yourself? And if, uh, in my case, I think it was a bit more difficult because I was actually one of the course facilitators in both courses. So I, I was an insider as well, which is which can be problematic. But I captured uh, the dilemmas, the challenges I had um, with great transparency. I'm very happy to share that uh, diary, but I would need to check if I have any names or, or things in it <laughs> um, for confidentiality issues, uh, of course. Um, but that was, uh, I think, the key element to be transparent in the process. Penny, does, is this okay? Anybody else? I don't know if there's anybody else. We're coming up to eight o'clock. I think. Yes. I don't too long, but I think um, so. Maybe one more question. I think Catherine asked one earlier. Just let me see if I can. Catherine asked about uh, how best. Um, she could share your work with colleagues, busy academic developers who look for ideas and would get so much from your work. How? Yes. Sorry. How? Um, Catherine, as you know, my work is, uh, I have a blog. Uh, there's a lot uh, online. I'm very happy to, you know, people can contact me if they need help with anything. Um, you know where to find me. Um, but my thesis is online. Um, I don't know exactly what you're looking for. Uh, very happy to help in any way I can. Catherine? She's blog and thesis are probably much to share. Um, I'd like to share your model for concise. I think what we need, Chrissy, is a, a, a Chrissy info kit that we can give people. That's what we need. 
Um, well, maybe we can do uh, one collectively, isn't it? I mean, it doesn't need to be a Chrissy in for kit. <laughs> <laughs> we can do a GoGN one. So, well, we did do the researcher pack, but perhaps the, uh, it's interesting you say this. Um, we've been having conversations with Hewlett about what we might do in a future GoGN. And one of the things we talked about is how exactly this kind of how we can take um, GoGN research and sort of make that bridge to practitioners. So I think there's enough. I think GoGen is producing enough good stuff now. Yes. For example, that, that, that we could it needs to sort of work its way into practice. I think there's a kind of a, a kind of synthesis bridging um, role for GoGen there as well now. Yes, and I think what would be nice, I mean, now we are talking about, about that, because I think, yes, we are not just doing research for research's sake, isn't it? We are doing it, we want to make, A, get new insights, but also insights that would be useful for ourselves, but also for others, like you say, to implement, uh, then to practice. Uh, and maybe, I mean, Catherine is organizing a conference, the next uh, OER 19 in, in Galway next year. Could there be something specific about that around uh, the GoGN work and maybe like help colleagues pitch who will be there to practitioners, what they have done uh, and, and see how others could take it forward. So it's a bit more, you know, promoted the work um, we are all doing. Yeah, that sounds a really good idea. We are talking to Catherine and Marin about what we'll do at uh, Cool way. So um, I think that's a really good point to wrap it up because actually one of the things I've been told I must do is to make sure that everyone knows about OER 19 in Galway next year. Um, so hopefully we'll see you there. So uh, we usually we do the um, GoGN seminars prior to the OE Global Conference, but that's shifted to October, November next year. So we're aligning it with the uh, OER 19 conference in Galway, um, which I think will be a, a really good opportunity. It's a I, I do like the OER conference. It's become a very good sort of critical voice in, in the open world. So um, we'll be running that there. Um, and get your papers in. Is the call for papers open yet, Catherine? There they are. Good. So uh, Deb's put the link in there as well. So, so uh, we'll see you all in Galway, hopefully. Um, does anyone else have any questions, particularly? If not, I'll stop the recording. Um, any other points anyone wants to raise? Okay, so I'm going to stop the recording. Just say thank you again, Chrissy, for an excellent presentation.